and covering the major technologies of humanity as we work our way through history. At this point, we've done a few different projectile weapons, from the atlatl to the sling to two varieties of bows. As we start to advance further into history, things start to get a little bit more complicated. When we start to add technologies like a trigger into the weapon, we're gonna try and make today the crossbow. To learn a little bit more on the history and background, I talked to a historian who just written a book on the history of the crossbow. So like many great technologies, its origins are in ancient China. The earliest really solid evidence we have for the crossbow is uh, very ancient China. So they're in the, the terracotta army has crossbowmen in it with very detailed surviving crossbows in it here. So in China, it has its origin in kind of fifth, sixth century BC, maybe even earlier. And it's mm -hmm. used well for at least the next thousand plus years. European history is a bit messier. So we don't really get any evidence for it until this Roman writer called Vegetius writes this manual of war in the fourth century AD. So we're already like nearly a thousand years after its invention. And then it's from then we kind of get it in the Middle Ages. And so mm -hmm. there's a bit of a debate of, is it an independent invention? Or is it just, this is what 1500 years worth of messing around has produced. So most people kind of think of it as like linear evolution, where you go from the bow and arrow to the crossbow, and then eventually replaced with guns. But these weapons, their use kind of overlap quite a bit, didn't they? The ancient Chinese crossbow, they're really close to the overlapping technologies at that time when their standard bow that you would use for normal archery mounted onto a stock with mm -hmm. this trigger mechanism that has to be all the way back at the end of the stock because you have to get that full 28 inches. When you're in medieval Europe, they're a bit different. England uses the bow, then it uses the crossbow, then it abandons the crossbow for the bow again. And they kind of seem to do that. They don't completely abandon the crossbow, but it becomes a more tertiary weapon. But in other countries, you see a much more mixed use, uh, particularly in France, you see quite a bit of bows and crossbows used. They are kind of overlapping technologies and they often used together. A lot of armies would have both of them in it. Well, what are the advantages the crossbow had over traditional bows? The advantage disadvantage breakdown really is the crossbow is generally going to be more powerful than a bow. Crossbow has this potential to become extremely powerful, whereas the longbow kind of taps out at what's physically possible to draw. The other real advantage the crossbow has is that it can stay loaded. So when you pull it back into the trigger, it just rests there. There's no strain on your body, so you can keep a shot ready whenever you want. The bow's real advantage is just way faster. Discussion around how quickly it takes to reload a crossbow, it really depends what device you're using with it. But even then, they're never as fast as someone going all out with a bow is. What are some of the biggest misconceptions some people might have about crossbows? Well, aside from the fact they're almost always used by kind of movie villains, which I think is that everybody <laughs> loves crossbows. One of the big myths, I think, is there's this idea that the crossbow was this easy to use weapon that could be used to kill a knight and as such was kind of frowned upon by European society, which we do actually see this idea of like a poorly trained militiaman killing a highly trained elite was a real <laughs> complaint. It's in Don Quixote actually, but they're talking about the arquebus. And it's mm -hmm. kind of people apply it backwards thinking, well, the crossbow must have been the archibus of the 12th century. And it's it's not really the same. It's very different military content. Next up is actually building the crossbow. Stuart walked me through some of the key components that I'll need to make for my crossbow. But the main mm -hmm. bits, you need a bow, sometimes also called a lathe or a prod. You need your stock, which is the piece of wood you mounted it on. You need your trigger mechanism, which is generally based on what we call the lock. There's a peg trigger, which is a much simpler lock mechanism. Push the trigger up, it pushes the pin up and releases it. So they added stirrups. In Chinese, they often had, like they're made of rope versus in the early European ones, which have would be made of metal. So you put your foot into that and that allows you to use your legs to span the crossbow as opposed to having to use your arms. So that's a real benefit. You're no longer damaging your bow, you're using your much more powerful leg muscles. Thank you again to Stuart for sharing his knowledge. I had to unfortunately cut down his interview quite a bit. But you can watch the full thing in the link in the description. Lots of really interesting information in there. Be sure to check out his book, The Medieval Crossbow, A Weapon Fit to Kill a King, when it comes out later this summer. Now to start forging the metal parts. And for that, we've got a little help from AG, who at this point is basically a resident blacksmith. And they've actually been suggesting that I make a crossbow for quite a while now. So they're gonna be lending a, a pretty big hand in this. And while my workshop is still getting rebuilt, we're gonna be borrowing their space and a lot of their tools. So let's get started with the first part, and probably most important, the bow or prod. This is 5160 high carbon spring steel. We won't be trying to make our own carburized spring steel for reasons of safety. Just because pulling back 80 to 150 pounds here is what we're gonna estimate we're gonna get. We can't have that breaking, so we're going to be using 5160. It's a really reliable spring steel. It's a steel that I know really well. And we're going to taper our limbs down all the way. We're going to forge out the uh, prod or the limb. This is going to be the most tedious process out of the entire project because these two not only have to be perfect dimensionally to hit the weights that we want to hit, they also have to be perfectly symmetrical across. So even if we're out a little bit on one side, the other side has to match it perfectly or else our crossbow won't draw. It's also the hardest steel to move. It's not going to move as fast into the hammer, so it's going to take us quite a while. So we should probably get this heated up and get at it. So 
So next up, we're going to forge the stirrup, which is basically a ring that goes on the end of it, allows you to hold it down while you reload it. So we got a stock bar and the forge, going to flatten it out first and then wrap it around to make the loop shape. We're gonna start rolling this into a ring and then we're gonna forge weld it over the horn. And these nice tapers are gonna make sure that we have a nice even weld so we don't have a piece sticking out on top and bottom. And then because it's thinner here, we're gonna reduce the likelihood of a cold shut. And with this extra surface area, we're gonna get a much stronger weld all along this surface because this has to hold when we're stepping down on top of it and drawing the crossbow back. So now we have this piece of O1 tool steel, and out of this we're going to forge a flat spring bolt hold down. Uh, this will serve two purposes on our crossbow. Uh, the first is in case the crossbow is to tilt or tip, the bolt won't actually fall out, and you don't have to worry about keeping it perfectly level before you fire. And second, because we're using a pin lock mechanism, this will actually provide a hard stop so the pin can't come up from underneath it. So we're going to get this hot, and then we are going to forge it flat. And by flat, I mean around a sixteenth of an inch. Now for the last piece. The, the trigger mechanism, also called the tickler. The worst term ever made, yeah. Um, so we have some half inch steel heating up in the forge right now. We're gonna forge that down. Uh, pin locks are gonna be pretty easy. We don't have to worry about the engagement at the edge so there's no sear surface. Uh, we should be able to knock it out pretty quick. Okay, so what's, what are gonna be the steps of the process here? First step is we're gonna taper that down and draw that out. So we're gonna take it from round bar down into square and have a nice long taper to form the body. So now that we have this taper drawn out all the way up here, roughly to length, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go in and push these sharp corners down so those don't dig into your hand when you're pulling the trigger. And after we push those corners in just a little bit, we're gonna twist in this center section, just give it a little bit of detail. And after we do that, or even before, I guess the order doesn't really matter, we can come back up here and forge in a little bit of detail so this will flatten out and swell and give kind of an end stop so we don't just have this trailing end on the end of our trigger. Thank you to Helix Sleep for sponsoring today's video. I look forward to getting a good night's sleep once I know I have this crossbow locked and loaded for my personal protection. But you know what else helps you with a good night's sleep? A high quality bed like today's sponsor. Helix Sleep makes premium mattresses and bedding that's customized to fit your needs and conveniently shipped right to your door. It comes rolled up in a box and is super easy to set up yourself. They have a simple quiz that you can fill out and get matched with the best mattress for your sleep pattern. I'm personally more of a stomach sleeper, so they paired me with a Helix Dusk mattress. I've had the mattress for several months now, and I have to say it's pretty outstanding. The difference is really noticeable, and it's hard to go back to the old mattress. The best part about all this is the Helix delivers your mattress right to your door for free within the US. With your Helix Sleep mattress, you get a 100 night sleep trial, along with a 10 year warranty, and there are financing options and flexible payment plans. Every step of the process is super easy, from the survey that helps guarantee a perfect match to your personal sleeping style, to the delivery and setup when it gets delivered right to your door. I had this mattress unpacked and ready to go in under 15 minutes, and I've slept pretty amazingly every night since. The amazing sleep that you'll get with this mattress works with the zoned lumbar support cells, which are designed to better cradle your body as you sleep. These coils are softer under your shoulders while firmer under your hips to better align to your natural body shape. This gives you a consistent pressure relief on your joints and muscles throughout the night, guaranteeing the best sleep possible. All the mattresses are made in the USA and are certified to be both safe to you and the environment, certified by the Certa Pure US program. 
Click on the link below or go to helixsleep.com slash HDMI for up to $200 off your Helix Sleep mattress plus two free pillows. So we got all the metal pieces all forged up. So now we gotta do the wood. So what, walk us through that process. So we have some rough cut lumber here that's just a two by four, but none of it's actually going to be flat and nothing is going to fit together nice. And with upcoming projects, I think this is gonna be a really good time to learn some hand tool woodworking. So we have some of my planes here. Uh, we're going to take the stock down to size and we're going to carve it out, we'll go through. So the first step here is to square up our lumber and then we can go and mark out our lines and make the stock. And to do that, we have a selection of hand planes. Put in the vise. Now that we have our reference surface plane down flat, we've checked it with a square. That means that we can start squaring up the other sides according to this. Soon. Eyeball it, see if it's square. Now that we have our crossbow stock all squared up, uh, one of the things that we're really going to need on our crossbow is a track for the bolt to ride in. We can just take this and track a line down. We can chase this in with a chisel. So there's our first bit of layout. Both sides. Nice. All right, so we have most of the crossbow done now. Next, we need something to actually shoot with it. So we need to make some bolts. First up, we need to make the arrowhead for them. Previously, we've done tanged arrows, which are a little bit easier to make, but because of the force that the crossbow will actually shoot these, we need to make socketing. First up, what we've done is we've taken the end down and we're starting to form a flat kind of conical shape. I was using the rounding end of the hammer. And now after this heat, because we have this established, I'll probably switch over to a cross pin and really starting to widen this out and turn it into a thin sheet that'll be rolled over into our socket at the end. This is all going to be wrapped around and that's what's going to form the socket of our head. And this is going to keep going on. We're going to get less and less heat. So it's kind of important to move fast because even now these heats are way faster, but this is going to get down to the same thickness as sheet metal, uh, all the way down from the half inch stock that we started with. What we can do is we can start rolling this over and all this thin sheet will start to form that little conical socket that will then attach to the shaft of our bolt. What we're going to do now is start to form the bodkin point up here. Uh, so what that means is we'll start to define this shoulder that's naturally formed over the edge of the anvil a little bit more and get that little neck in. And after that, we can cut it off and we'll actually hold it from this side and start to form the point down. After tragically breaking the first prod, Adri went through the entire process to make a brand new one, this time making sure the heat treatment was absolutely perfect. So after a lot of trouble, I have the prod now all strung up. Now comes the very last step of tying it onto the crossbow. Just go like this. The process of tying it through this hole onto there. 
And uh, this is actually the easier way to do it, but still gonna be a huge pain. So let's get started. Get lots of wrapping and tightening. Cause we need it really tight, cause there's gonna be a lot of force in these releases and we don't wanna fall apart. All right, so we got the crossbow all assembled and uh, ready to fire. Haven't actually fired it yet, but we're at the range. We can give it a shot. We just measured it. It's at about 110 pound draw strength, which is a bit more powerful than the bows. The last few bows that I made are a little underwhelming, but uh, this one's a lot more promising. And then for comparison, a few uh, different bows to try it out next to and see see how they compare. Yeah, <laughs> Pretty cool. It's uh, definitely there's a lot of resistance. As far as how much you gotta really crank down on it to get to fire, but then it's it's got a nice oomph to it. Where, Survived. Shot. Where did where'd it go? <laughs> oh no. <laughs> the uh, arrowhead did not stay on the actual shaft, so we've not lost it. <laughs> um, which are pretty nice. You can tell it as a left is very front heavy, so it just kind of dipped down and kind of landed almost 45 degree into the target, but it seemed to shoot with decent force. You can tell it's pretty good success and a lot of fun to shoot. Uh, you got a, a bit of stretch to the bowstring and this is all coming loose from the lashing, so you might need to wedge it in there, but it hasn't fallen apart. It hasn't blown up in anybody's face and it shoots. So I think I think those are all the check marks for a successful crossbow. No, so originally this prod was designed to have a two and a half or three inch brace height. So the string should be sitting back here, but under the power of this bow, it's actually stretching out. So now we're stuck here with about a one inch brace height. I think I have an idea though. So what if we, so we twist it first to get the uh, that length back, right? Yeah. I sat down, you held this, and I put my feet against it and I pulled back like I was rowing. So close. Okay. Oh, teamwork makes the dream work. All right, let's see where this goes. No. We're here with my friend Kyle, uh, who has his longbow and I've come with my recurve bow. We have a couple different limb sets for uh, two different recurves here actually, so we can try out and see you know, where they compare against a, a known variable. It is much, much easier to take someone who's new to archery, hand them a crossbow and make them proficient. You can get them up and accustomed to it within a week, whereas it can take years in order to train someone to be proficient with a longbow or recurve bow. What's the draw weight on this? Uh, 60 at 26. <laughs> it's an acquired taste. Yeah. How does this compare to uh, your regular bow? Uh, let's see, it's definitely different, but I loved it. Um, first time shooting any sort of bow with a trigger on it. Um, let's see, uh, I was impressed. I was not expecting uh, a string this wide to function as well as it did, but we were able to lob some heavy bolts, 40 yards, no problem. Had some hiccups along the way, learned a couple things, lost a couple of points on the bolts, but Overall, it was awesome. We've got the next phase in uh, weapon technology with the crossbow and uh, one step closer to the eventual gunpowder age. So we get, thank you again to all of our supporters on Patreon. Thanks again for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe and check out other content we have covering a wide variety of topics. Also, if you've enjoyed these series, consider supporting us on Patreon. We are largely a fan-funded channel and depend on the support of our viewers in order to keep our series going. Thanks for watching.